So my talk is going to uh, hopefully be fairly low on any kind of mathematical details. Uh, I'll show a few snippets of code, but hopefully, hopefully fairly light. Um, what I wanted to talk about was, um, was what we're trying to do with a, as a technology pipeline to make it easier to do research or development with, uh, with machine learning. So our aim at Wolfram generally is to try and automate computation. And in the context of machine learning, that's to abstract away all of the detail that one doesn't need to know about in order to be able to do tasks and have a pipeline through from concept to, to execution in minimum time. So at the same time, we want to try and make it so that somebody who knows virtually nothing about machine learning can do machine learning. But equally, if you are an expert, we want to make it so that you can be more productive and more sophisticated. And that's uh, a tricky design problem to try and figure out how to do both of those at once. So also behind this is a sort of write once, deploy many philosophies. So everything I'm going to show you, uh, with two small exceptions, because I picked up a new version of the Wolfram language last night, um, will run unchanged on a Raspberry Pi. Now, of course, in the context of machine learning, there's a great asymmetry between training and running of, uh, of classifiers and predictors. And so typically what you'll want to do is to build models on a proper desktop, or if you can't do that, if it has to be feeding from data that's coming from the device in the field, then you could run those things as a cloud service. But actually, if you had to be autonomous, you could run everything that I'm going to show on the Raspberry Pi uh, completely unaided. So my claim is going to be that, uh, that this whole ambition is made possible by the symbolic nature of the Wolfram language, the sort of base idea of the technology stack that we've been building. So anyone who's familiar with what we do at all, if you uh, use Mathematica in college, then what most people think of with, symbol with symbolic computation is things like computer algebra. So um, being able to ask some symbolic question, like some integral, say, and get some symbolic answer back. But here I'm talking much more abstractly about symbolic computation that's nothing to do with computer algebra. So let me give you a kind of example of of what I mean by this. Here's a the sort of very basic computer algebra operation. I'm going to take some expression here and substitute variables. Very computer algebra. But the idea of the language is that once you've got an operation that can work on symbolic expressions, it can work on anything. It doesn't have to be algebra. Behind the scenes, this thing has a very Lisp-like structure that says it's a plus of some terms. And these functions, we know all about plus and times. But there's nothing the language actually needs to know about plus and times for this kind of replacement to work. So I can take some data that's nothing like a bit of computer algebra, like this 3D laser scan of my face. Which way around is it that way? And do exactly the same kind of operations to say, let's replace, in this case, all of the triangles with lines and turn the thing into a wireframe model without having to invent uh, some new language for handling CAD data. So the, the key step, then, is once you've got a language that can work with symbolic data, Anything you can represent symbolically is identical. And in practice, you can represent everything uh, with these kind of symbolic Lisp-like structures. So there's the maths, but we could have a look at what a photograph looks like behind the scenes, or a uh, graph network. All of these things have a kind of symbolic serialization, which means that we can treat all data identically. And that's the sort of key step of, uh, of trying to automate a pipeline of, of really flexible machine learning. OK, enough preamble. Let's, uh, let's talk about some machine learning and what this pipeline looks like in practice. When you actually abstract away the details, like which algorithm you're going to use, then actually there aren't very many basic tasks that uh, there are for, in machine learning. There's things like um, supervised uh, classification, supervised prediction, uh, sequence prediction, uh, unsupervised clustering. There's a fairly small number of basic concepts. And our idea is that uh, at the top level, we can take some data, and here's a classic machine learning uh, example of some form measurements of some flowers and the classes they're in, and reduce machine learning to a single command like sign or cos in the language and say, let's classify that flower data. And what we get back is a symbolic object. This symbolic object represents the entire model. And just like any symbolic object, we can assign it to variables. So I've stored it here for reference. And now it behaves like a program. It's a built-in command now where I can just say, take um, uh, some unseen data and make some predictions about which probabilities that's, that's come from. So the ability to kind of wrap up all of the details of this in this sort of abstracted object requires this, uh, this symbolic data just simply to be able to hold the result in a generalized way. And hidden really small print here is a key step in it. It says here, you won't be able to read from the back, method logistic regression. 
I didn't say that in classify. I let it figure that out uh, for itself. And this is another key step in, in the automation. Now, as an expert, I might know a bit better here, and I might want to roll up my sleeves here and say uh, method goes to, um, let's say, um, random forest and redo that training using a different method, and we get back an object which is 100% compatible. I can still, I don't need to see any of those details, but the whole structure of the model is completely different because we've got this really rich object that can hold the necessary parameters, the type of uh, model, and, um, and, and wrap all of that up into, into something that I can move around, serialize, drop onto my Raspberry Pi, and so on. Now, the input data, as I said, all data is the same uh, as far as we're concerned. So I can make a list and I can put in a list, a number and an integer and a string and a photograph and a document. And, and so as long as we can automate the process of, uh, of feature detection from that, we can take data that now is much more mixed. Like I've got a string, an age and a string. These are the passengers of the Titanic and this person survived. But the task we do is exactly identical. We just say train that, classify it. It's decided to use... Um, um, a random forest this time, and now we can use that on unseen data. But this goes much further than simply dealing with um, sort of basic computer science types. We can give it really rich structured data as long as we can deal with that encoding and uh, featured section step. So here I'm doing exactly the same task, exactly the same command, classify, but this time I'm giving some photographs that are night or daytime, and it's going to go away and uh, think about that for a second build a classifier, and now we can apply it to this unseen data, and it's not done a terribly good job on picture number two, which it thinks is nighttime, but apart from that, it seems to have done a reasonable job. So, one question is, uh, does it work? Can you automate all of this away? Well, they're always going to be, when you're pushing the, the cutting edge, you want to get involved in the details, and there's lots of things I didn't specify, like, like class priors and um, and sub-details of the, the methods, which I could roll up my sleeves and do. But actually, in practice, just hitting a, a bunch of data on this um, does a, a reasonably good job. So if I just get it, let's use a person. Do we have some objects? See what uh, makes of this. So bottled water, pretty good. Uh, we could ask it. It's never going to figure out anything about the location, but let's ask it what it thinks anyway. A stage. Well, <laughs> um, that's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, it can, uh, we'll ask it what it thinks I am, I'm male, and now the, the risky one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was much more, <laughs> I think it's the early morning I had to get here that's made, aged me overnight. It uh, did a pretty good job of being within a year or two of my uh, age in, uh, in, at, uh, back in the office. Maybe it's the unflattering lighting. Let's stop that. Now, actually you can achieve quite a lot with other forms of hidden automation. So let me do a little uh, toy that I... Um, I wrote here that um, uh, uh, let's uh, teach it rock, paper, scissors. So I've uh, got no data here at all. I'm going to capture some pictures of rock. I'm just going to move it around, give it some experience. And then after I've got about 10 of those, we'll have it uh, do some paper images, get ready with scissors. Let's give it about 10 of those. All right, that's enough. And then some scissors, give it different angles. And then we've got enough of those. We'll and we'll do train. Whoops, let's hide the code. I'll reveal that in a moment. So it's having a little think. It's building my classifier. And now if I put it into watch mode, then hopefully it'll say rock, paper, scissors, paper, rock. Pretty good. But if you look at the code that I wrote, in fact, uh, it's entirely interface code. This is all image capture and trying to not capture too many images too fast. And here's the real work. I'm just calling this, uh, this built-in uh, function classify, and it's done a pretty good job in just 30 images. There's a trick for how it manages to do that that I'll reveal in a minute. Um, oh, let's just do one more then, just to show that things like type, different types work nicely. This isn't going to work, because I didn't re, I didn't load the classifiers in advance, so it's probably going to have a good think now. Uh, I love talking about math. And I was right. I should have load, downloaded the classifiers before, and it's actually downloading classifiers in the back. Let's forget that one. If, uh, if I'm using pre-built classifiers, it needed to download them, and I forgot to do that. Right, let's talk about what's going on actually under the hood. What is this, this pipeline? Um, so at the start, I said all data is the same. So we start with this uh, symbolic data at the top, and then we have to extract some features from it. So that's partly an encoding step. Can we turn an image and go, oh, OK, this looks like uh, an RGB 
image or maybe it's a CMYK image and turn that into a set of numbers in some canonicalized form, but then looking for the actual features that we can train against. We then have the automatic algorithm selection in order to decide what's the right approach, and then we build a model which we store for later use, and then when it comes to actually using it, we have to do the same loop of symbolic input, extract features, put them into the model, get the prediction out. Now, for that beginner case, we want to hide all of that pipeline, but sometimes those things are useful in themselves, and sometimes you want to mess with how they do it to get take full control. So I wanted to pick out a couple of cases where uh, exposing the internals actually is, the, is the, the key thing. Now, supervised feature extraction is, uh, is, is one such case, and this is the trick that actually went on in my rock, paper, scissors. With 30 data points, it's not really possible to learn very much about the features in the image. So part of the automation pipeline is to say, OK, that data is not going to work. Let's fall back to a, a feature extractor that we pre-trained on tens of thousands of image net data images to, to figure out what is an appropriate set of features to look for. So it already knew to look for things like lines and corners or textures or whatever it is that uh, are the features that come out. So that actually 30 data points was already enough for it to start figuring out uh, um, um, how to apply those things in a, in a useful way to that particular task. Uh, but that image extractor, we want to be able to roll up our sleeves and get to as well. So there's a, an automated step here called feature extraction. Here's some images. I just uh, took a little subset of the um, Stanford dog database here, just three different breeds of dog. And I'm going to run a feature extractor on that. So this is the step that would go on behind the scenes in the, in the um, rock, paper, scissors example, except it would have bought very early when it figured out it didn't have much data. Here it's got enough data to start doing a little bit more thinking to try and figure out how do we create the, a feature set that is dimension reduced to the things that are salient to, to this experience. And so if I give it a piece of data it hasn't seen, you can see that it's, um, it's reduced this Basset Hound down to a feature vector of, uh, it's decided 59 key things are what matters to distinguish between the data set of, uh, I think this is only about 60 odd images, uh, but enough that it's starting to learn that it can reduce this down to six, 59 data points. As soon as we've got that concept, then we can start doing things like uh, measuring feature distance. So here's two dogs that are 21 uh, apart in this 59-dimensional space. And hopefully, if it's done a good job here, and I give it to less similar dogs, a basset and a chihuahua, it says, well, those look further apart in that feature space. Who knows what it's looking at, pointiness of ears or uh, brownness of background or whatever. And then as soon as you've got that, you can start layering in all of the other kinds of computation we automate, like, um, like uh, cluster analysis and, uh, and, and nearest searching. And we can take an image here and say, OK, what's the nearest image in the database to that dog? And so um, to me, that looks like, I guess it's, well, I, since, given that I know I only put three breeds in, it must be a basset hound. It's a slightly um, um, beagle-ish looking basset hound. I guess it's a puppy. So it's decided that this has shares the most features uh, with this out of the list of all the images that we saw before. And if we push that to extremes, then uh, we can start forming clusters. Ideally, you want to do the clusters in 59-dimensional space. But here I'm going to have the feature space reduced down to two dimensions. And you can see the kind of clusters starting to form that we have... Uh, uh, Labradors down here, but actually two clusters, the dark Labradors and the pale Labradors. All the hounds have gone in that corner, and all these uh, ugly little chihuahua dogs are up in the top right corner. <laughs> but in the end, this is just, um, it's just all part of that same automated uh, pipeline. Now, there's another place where the symbolic computation comes in really well as well, is that it actually, in the model development, where if you really want to roll up your sleeves, and I'm assuming you're the expert audience here that, that actually cares about uh, the details of the model and doesn't trust the, the black box, although I guess you don't want to be in machine learning if you can't trust black boxes a bit. Um, how can we use symbolic computation to represent models better? So here's, we've already seen this one. This is what I use to spot the bottled water. It's uh, wrapped up into uh, a function that gives me a little bit easier syntactic access to say, let's turn the specificity goal of that right down to zero, and it'll say it's just an animal. But behind that is a convolutional neural net. But just like with things like mathematics, where we spend time saying, well, what are the primitives of maths? There's functions like sine, cos, and tan. There's things like uh, limits and integrals and differential and derivatives. There's a fairly small number of primitives that allow you to express most of mathematics. Well, there's a fairly small number of primitives that allow you to describe neural networks. There's convolutional layers, and there's recurrent layers, and, and those things can be expressed just like an equation can. 
So if we ask for it behind what's going on behind the scenes, here's a symbolic representation of the neural network that uh, is doing that image identification. So some of these layers are fairly straightforward. There's a, there's a ramp layer, and, uh, and some of them are quite rich, like this net graph layer. If I click on that, you'll see actually it's, it contains a whole bunch of sub-layers within the, the graph. And because we've got this symbolic representation of graphs, well, you can represent the interconnectivity of all of these layers. Uh, the outer layer is just, a, is just a net chain. It's one net feeding into the next. But within these graph layers, we've got interconnecting flows going in different directions. But because we've got a symbolic representation of that, then it's data just like anything else. So I can write uh, programs that rearrange the data, or just like I did with my face, I could transform this. I could join it to another network. Um, each layer represents several bits of information wrapped up in a little symbolic object. It's got, if I go back to a simpler layer, let's say this convolution layer, then we've got some parameters, we've got what the thing does, and we have some weights that are the bits that have to be optimized. And so when I train this thing, those weights change, but the structure doesn't. So let's do something very simple here. I'm just going to make a simpler net chain that is the first five elements of that. So I just transform that symbolic object into a simpler symbolic object. And then I'm going to apply that to this tiger image. And it won't complete the job because I've just taken the first five steps. So we're going to get some matrices passing through. So I'm going to say, let's turn those matrices into images. And so in a couple of lines of code, I get a chance to start seeing what's going on inside the neural network, that uh, at layer five, some of these neurons have effectively died out and have got no information. Others are firing up and doing something interesting now. Early on in the chain, these probably represent convolutional steps where we're detecting lines and, and, uh, and solid areas and so on. But when we get a bit deeper, these things are probably becoming much more abstract concepts like animalness or... Uh, or uh, indoorsness or things like that that might represent these different things. But we get the insights start reaching into the network that we've just transformed from the base network in order to start saying, uh, well, what's going on or to transform the thing or to automatically generate a thousand different neural networks with a certain variation in structure and then comparing which ones work best. Okay, I'm going to step back from machine learning for a moment and just uh, extend the, the kind of the metaphor of this serialization. If we, uh, if we go back to, let's do one of the simpler ones here. Let's look at this one here. This model that we built, no, that was the data. Um, this model that we built, this was it here. These things all have, um, have a serialization using the symbolic representation. So if I say, I, mean, I don't want to see the whole thing. It'll be about 20 pages long, but uh, let's have a plain text serialization of that model then you'll see that, um, and that's too short, let's have 30 lines of input. You'll see that there's a, the symbolic structure of the classifier that we've, we've built. So that allows the thing to be portable. That's why I can drop this classifier now that it's built straight onto the Raspberry Pi and have the, the Wolf language engine that ships with uh, Raspberry and automatically interpret that. Um, but it also allows other workflows for deployment. So I can take... Uh, um, uh, Okay, let's uh, get the Titanic one again. I can take that and I can ask it for an interface, which then might be something that I actually drop onto the Raspberry Pi so that if it's on some screen, uh, somebody can interact with the thing. So um, I'd throw away the code once I created it, but just like that integral I showed earlier, which took some symbolic thing and put out some symbolic thing, which represented question and answer, here it's taking in a program, our classifier, and a few bit of parameters, and it's generating a symbolic object that represents, and if I look behind the scenes here, lots and lots of code about um, making the thing appear uh, visually like an interface. And because it's serialized, as well as being able to make that thing as an interface in a kind of automated way, automating just like everything else that we do, I can also use that as a way of transferring it to other devices. So I can take that interface and say cloud deploy that, and it's just taken this, the classifier that I've built, and in one step set the thing up as a web page. So hopefully now if I point to this URL in the cloud, I have something where I can play with the same model um, out there in the cloud. I can change the parameters and see whether the person would survive or die. So it's not just about automating the machine learning. We want to automate the, all of the workflow processes. So that's things like data imports, data preparation. You know, we have a whole language for, machine uh, for image processing and audio processing and the like, right through the machine learning step to automating the deployment and, and even setting the thing up as, as um, things like a web service, which uh, I do have time to show. 
So here I'm just doing that with taking the same thing, serialize it, but this time I'm saying I want an API function with some parameters, and there we've got a, something I can call remotely. So when I do this URL execute, I'm calling the API with some parameters, but it's running now in the cloud uh, remotely. Now, of course, I wouldn't do that from the Wolfram language because I'm I might as well stay in the Wolfram language rather than put it on a server and call this, unless it was retraining automatically out there, but I might then say, let's have the Java code needed to call that from a Java, or I guess uh, Python's probably a bit simpler, the Python code to call that API. So now I can paste that into Python, and without having to do any machine learning in the Python, I can have that thing running and calling the cloud and, um, and, and doing the prediction. But this all the way through having a symbolic representation means that it's been about four or five lines of code to go from data to model to deployed as an interface to deployed as a web interface to deployed as an API. So even though, and this is true of lots of uh, bits of computation, even though the underlying bit of computation is numbers, all of these things that, all these machine learning techniques in the end work with vectors and numbers or matrices and numbers. The symbolic representation is what allows you to abstract away the details and to, and to move things around in a, in a rich way. Um, of course, there's only part of the uh, Wolfram language setup. I could happily give uh, half hour talks on about 20 different topics, but I am at the, um, at the demo area after this, so if you want to know about other areas away from machine learning, uh, uh, please come in and talk to me. Otherwise, I think we have a moment maybe to take one question before coffee. Is that right, or do we have longer? Yeah, we thank, thank the speaker first. Thank you.